In this video, we look at a simplified summary of the story The Klondike Gold Rush by Gerald T. Onert, which appeared in the February 1980 issue of the magazine Lost Treasure. A missive from a diligent miner, relinquishing his claim on Dominion Creek, finds its place on the notice board of the mining office in Dawson City, situated within the wondrous Yukon Territory. The lease, now divisible into individual gold claims spanning a mere 500 feet each, sparks a frenzy among prospectors. The Ballantine brothers hailing from California unearth coarse gold nestled within the crevices of exposed bedrock near the ferry docking point in Dawson City. Seizing this golden opportunity, they promptly lay claim to the creek, causing a cascade of claims to follow suit in the ensuing weeks. Such is the fervor of the gold rush that an Alaskan stakes his claim, extending a staggering 96 feet from the mouth of the creek into the Yukon River. It is the year 1979, marking 81 years since the inception of the world's most monumental gold rush. Within the Klondike 40-mile gold fields lies the most bountiful bed of placer mining the world has ever witnessed. Kogasa, a colossal mining enterprise of German origin, proudly establishes its headquarters on the illustrious 60-mile river within the Yukon Territory. My beloved wife Elizabeth and I succumb to the fever that grips the hearts of all in 1978, becoming part of the fervent epidemic that engulfs 1978-79. Overwhelmed by the initial astonishment of beholding two pennyweight nuggets in our gold pan, we ultimately secure the placer mining rights to approximately one and a half miles of precious terrain on Hunker Creek, the second most prosperous creek within the Yukon Territory. Dawson City, even now, retains a fragment of the ambiance that once permeated the air during the world's most eminent gold rush. Its essence echoes that of 1898, albeit tinged with elements of novelty and change. In August of 1896, George Carmack, a spirited Californian, accompanied by his trusty Indian companions, takes respite at the majestic Rabbit Creek within the Klondike region. It is here that destiny graces them with the discovery of the coarse gold that ignites the monumental stampede. In due course, Rabbit Creek is granted a befitting new moniker, Bonanza. In the following years, a never-ending parade of scruffy miners made their way through the treacherous Chilkoot Pass and sailed down the icy waters of the Yukon River, heading towards the heart of the gold rush, Dawson City. By 1900, the Klondike was teeming with around 40,000 hopeful prospectors. But these miners faced a peculiar challenge, the permafrost, an eternal layer of frozen earth in the frigid lands. They soon discovered that the best time to dig was during winter. With determination and resourcefulness, they would burn through the permafrost using wood fires, delving deep into the ground until they struck the precious pay dirt, often found at the bedrock, sometimes as deep as 30 feet. They would then hoist it to the surface using a windlass and stack it in frozen heaps, waiting for the thaw of spring when it could be properly processed. This method of mining persisted until around 1910, when large dredging companies took over the most lucrative creeks of the Klondike. They continued their operations until 1966, when the last dredge ceased its operations. The cost of running these massive dredges became unsustainable, as the price of gold, fixed at $1.35 an ounce during that time, could no longer cover the expenses. But how is it that, despite all the mining activity in the Klondike, there is still enough gold to make a man wealthy. The answer lies in the unique characteristics of this region. Firstly, the permafrost plays a role, as it preserves gold that may have been overlooked or considered insufficiently rich by the miners of the past. What was once meager ground to them is now a treasure trove for the miners of 1979. Secondly, the Klondike is a semi-arid area with minimal rainfall, receiving only 11.2 inches of precipitation annually. Water is an essential element for placer mining in the Klondike and, with modern equipment like powerful water pumps, previously inaccessible areas can now be worked profitably. Even ground with as little as one-fifth pennyweight of gold per yard can be a source of profit for the small-scale miner. With the aid of advanced machinery, such as the tracked bulldozer, the earth can be stripped away effortlessly, 
allowing the permafrost to melt and revealing the riches beneath. Ground that was once considered thin and unproductive is now a source of wealth for those who dare to venture into the Klondike's embrace. And so the allure of gold continues to beckon adventurers and dreamers alike as they journey to the Klondike in search of their fortune, driven by the promise of abundant riches hidden within its frozen grasp. In the farthest reaches of the north, where the allure of gold dances in the air, outsiders venture for two distinct reasons. Some, merely seeking a taste of adventure, journey to the gold fields during their fleeting months of respite, hoping to witness the vibrant tapestry of life that unfolds there. Others, driven by earnest ambition, arrive with a purpose, to toil for a coveted gold claim. Most of these intrepid souls hail from the vast expanse of America, where they have honed their skills in the gold fields of the western United States, particularly California. However, upon reaching the Klondike, they often find themselves disenchanted, for the mining conditions differ vastly from their previous endeavors. The trusty suction dredges, an indispensable tool in their previous pursuits, hold little value in these icy lands. You see, beneath the frozen gravel and muck lies the bedrock, a staggering 30 feet below on average, and in some areas a daunting 90 feet down. Such depths render the dredges futile. Moreover, the Klondike's clear and deep creeks, essential for dredging, are an anomaly in this semi-arid climate. Those fortunate enough to find success with a dredge are often well acquainted with a fellow miner who has already unearthed the gold-bearing gravel above the bedrock. These areas can be leased for a mere 10% of the precious bounty discovered. Venturing about 75 miles from Dawson City, one encounters the 40-mile district of Alaska. Here, those who employ dredges have achieved some measure of triumph as the bedrock lies tantalizingly close, often just a few feet beneath the surface. For those content with a meager yield during their vacation, dredging in this region is considered a triumph indeed. However, it is imperative for any foreign visitor or prospector to acquaint themselves with the new laws governing the Klondike. To this end, an American traveler would be wise to first visit the mining recorder's office in Dawson City, nestled within the Yukon Territory of Canada. It is a curious misconception held by many, both Canadian and American, that the Klondike gold fields reside in Alaska. Nay, dear friends, the Yukon Territory, a jewel of Canada, claims this fabled land. The mining recorder, a font of knowledge, stands ready to address the inquiries that may plague your curious mind. Whilst I sojourned in Whitehorse, another splendid enclave within the Yukon Territory, I took the liberty of conversing with the esteemed head of Canadian immigration regarding the mining laws that govern foreigners. Should an American grace the Klondike's hallowed grounds merely as a visitor, maintaining their tourist status, they shall be spared the onerous burden of procuring the requisite work permits, a privilege enjoyed solely by American miners with placer claims. In the far north, in the majestic land of the Klondike, outsiders venture for two reasons, curiosity and the yearning to toil upon a golden claim. Most Americans who journey to this mystical realm bear the wisdom of the Californian gold fields, only to be disheartened by the contrasting mining conditions. Alas, the beloved suction dredge brought by many is but a feeble tool here, as the bedrock lies deep and the creeks are scarce. Yet a glimmer of hope remains, for some miners find triumph in leasing areas once stripped by others. A mere 75 miles from Dawson City, the 40-mile district of Alaska presents better prospects for dredging. However, it is crucial for foreigners to acquaint themselves with the mining laws of the Klondike. Seek guidance from the mining recorder's office in Dawson City, where the wisdom of the land shall be bestowed upon you. Fear not, dear American tourists, for if you maintain your esteemed tourist status, work permits akin to those held by American miners with placer claims shall not be required in the mystical realm of the Klondike, where the rivers flowed with whispers of gold, adventurers from distant lands sought to secure their fortune. To embark on this daring quest, one must acquire the coveted mining claim, a precious document that grants access to the bountiful earth. But lo, there was another requirement, a water permit, to quench the thirst of the land and nurture the dreams of those who dared to venture deeper. For those with small aspirations, 
the path to water rights was an easy one, like a gentle breeze caressing their hopes. Yet, for those with grand ambitions, the restrictions grew as mighty as the mountains themselves. But fear not, for the laws of the Klondike knew no boundaries, treating Canadians, Americans, and foreigners alike as equals in their pursuit of gold. Ah, but finding an open claim was merely the first step on this treacherous journey. It did not guarantee wealth or even a modest living. Every creek in the Klondike whispered secrets of gold hidden within its depths. But whether these secrets held enough fortune to be mined profitably was a question that echoed through the valleys, leaving many hopeful hearts in uncertainty. Beware, dear wanderers, of the areas scarred by the colossal dredges, for though they hold glimmers of gold, they demand pricey tools to be tamed. Instead, seek the humble embrace of a small side stream, where the echoes of the first gold rush still linger. Such was the ground chosen by my wife and me, a stream that gracefully flowed into the right fork of Hunker Creek, nestled 24 miles away from the enchanting Dawson City. As we ventured forth, signs of the old-timer's endeavors greeted us, whispering tales of forgotten dreams. A buried mining car, veiled by the moss, whispered of a bygone era. Two ancient shafts and a moss-covered tailing pile stood like sentinels, guardians of the past. And nearby, a weathered hand dug pool and remnants of a windless handle and a rusty gold pan told stories of toil and determination. Curiosity tugged at our souls, urging us to explore the mysteries within. I tested the tailing pile, discovering heavy black sand and glimmers of mist gold as precious as a grain. In that moment, we knew we had found our destiny. With hearts bursting with excitement, we staked a discovery claim upon this sacred ground, and as time flowed like the rivers, we claimed the remaining valley as our own. A wise Canadian friend, a seasoned miner of the Klondike, beheld our chosen ground and saw the spark of promise. With his blessing, he joined us as our partner, a beacon of guidance in this vast and untamed land. Just beyond the ridge lay the gold claims of Pete Erickson, a fortunate soul who reaped the treasures of the earth. The old-timers had worked his ground, but whispers in the wind spoke of its richness, far beyond what we could fathom. Pete's tales of gathering 30 ounces of gold in a mere fortnight ignited our dreams, fueling our determination to uncover the secrets of the Klondike. Oh, the Klondike, a realm where dreams and reality intertwined, where hope and perseverance walked hand in hand. Its valleys whispered of riches untold, of fortunes waiting to be unearthed. As the old-timers once danced to the rhythm of gold, so too shall we, the outsiders, who journeyed from distant lands in search of our destiny. And in this realm of enchantment, American miners need not fret about work permits, for as long as they embrace their tourist status, the land welcomes them with open arms, ready to reveal its hidden wonders. After two years in the Klondike, my wife and I have become pragmatic enough not to anticipate a fortune from our placer claims. We would be content with decent wages for our toil, but who knows what lies in store. We ponder the mystery of why the old-timers chose to employ the sizable mining car that now rests upon our claim. Perhaps the creek's gold originates from a bench on the valley's side, potentially widening the PA streak beyond the norm. We count ourselves fortunate that bedrock lies a mere 12 to 15 feet below the surface. In the autumn of 1979, a D8 caterpillar cleared around 200 feet of the lower claim, penetrating roughly six feet into the muck. Soft muck halted the cat's progress as there was a risk of it getting stuck. Come spring, when the ground freezes, stripping the moss and trees will be easier, allowing the permafrost to thaw naturally. When we departed in mid-October, my partner was diligently digging at the 10-foot level, still in pursuit of bedrock. We anxiously await news of whether his efforts shall be rewarded. The Klondike still holds a vast reserve of gold, attracting numerous multi-million dollar operations. Each year, fresh prospectors arrive, often spurred by the information contained in the publication, Notes on Placer Mining in the Yukon Territory. In one paragraph's conclusion, the document states, in 1977, one operator reported recovering X ounces from a one four-yard remnant left by the old-timers, Dawson City. 
a distant realm lying 3,000 to 4,000 miles away from the United States, reveals itself to intrepid souls like us. Having traversed the arduous journey from upstate New York to the Klondike in a refurbished van worth a mere dollar 800, we discovered that a four-wheel drive vehicle, though convenient, is not an absolute necessity. The Alaska Highway, once a rugged dirt path, has transformed over the years, leaving only around 700 miles of unpaved road. While well-maintained, this treacherous stretch can be a formidable opponent during inclement weather. On this narrow road, encounters with mammoth 18-wheelers can be a hair-raising experience, but our misfortunes have been limited to a mere flat tire during our six sojourns. To ensure a smooth journey, it is prudent to ensure the suspension is in impeccable condition, equipped with eight ply tires and spare tubes to fend off any stone-induced bruises. A protective screen guarding the radiator, lights, and windshield is recommended to shield against the relentless onslaught of debris propelled by passing vehicles. In the realm of currency, gas prices in Canada fluctuate from $0.80 cents to $1.70, but remember, these figures are in Canadian dollars for imperial gallons. To convert them to their American counterparts, it is advisable to subtract one-third of the cost. The cost of living in Dawson City is exorbitantly high, approximately 160% of the U.S. average. Now the question arises, what equipment should one bring on this grand expedition? While most dismiss the utility of a dredge in the Klondike, exceptions do exist and it would be wise to carry one, for it would be a lamentable discovery to travel this great distance only to realize it should have been part of your arsenal. Naturally, a reliable gold pan is an indispensable tool. In Dawson City, lumber can be procured for constructing dump boxes and sluices for manual mining. A sturdy pick and shovel are essential companions for the arduous task of supplying dirt to your dump box. From May 1st onward, as the snow melts, placer mining commences in Dawson City, stretching its golden arms until mid-October. The weather during this time is often resplendent, with temperatures soaring into the 90s in July. August 2 is a month of unparalleled beauty, but beware, for the nocturnal chill may cause the temperature to plummet below freezing. By mid-June, the sun barely dips beneath the horizon, casting its iridescent glow upon the land for a full 24 hours, as Dawson City stands a mere 150 miles from the majestic Arctic Circle. The Klondike, a realm of limitless possibilities, beckons to those who dare venture forth into its enchanting embrace. Do not forget that despite the meager population of 24,000 souls in the vast expanse of the Yukon Territory, it is not the untamed wilderness that many envision. One must possess a license to partake in the pursuit of hunting or fishing, and foreigners are strictly forbidden from importing pistols. However, a rifle, so long as it is not automatic, is permissible, although it must remain securely stowed. Alas, the once thriving moose populations dwindle each passing year, and the hunting grounds are riddled with numerous restricted areas. Within Dawson City, where the population stands at a mere 860, the arrival of summer heralds an influx of tourists and miners alike. This near ghost town springs to life with the grand opening of Diamond Tooth Gertie's Gambling Hall. Here, amidst the gambling tables, visitors rub shoulders with gold miners, easily discerned by their prized nugget rings and other adornments fashioned from the gleaming treasure. Should you dare to venture into the Klondike, dear reader, allow me to share with you a handful of addresses that shall prove invaluable in your quest for information. Seek out the Canada Map Office, Surveys and Mapping Branch, Department of Energy, Mines and Resources in Ottawa, Canada, to obtain topographic maps that shall guide your path. Inquire with the Department of Tourism, located in Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, Canada, to secure the Yukon official road map brimming with essential details on campsites and general knowledge. And lastly, reach out to the mining recorder within the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs to access invaluable mining information. Embrace these tidings, intrepid traveler, and may they serve as your compass on the captivating journey that awaits you in the Klondike. If you're interested in purchasing a copy of this vintage magazine for yourself or as a gift for a friend or loved one, please click the link in the description.